My name is Shelley Densley, and today is October 23rd, 2017. I'm at Utah Valley University George Sutherland Archives in Orem, Utah, interviewing Suzanne Osman for the purpose of the Utah Women's Walk. And today we're going to be talking about Suzanne's life and her contributions to life in the state of Utah. So Suzanne, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. For coming and being part of the Utah Women's Walk. Let's start. Tell us a little bit about your background, um, when you were born, where, your parents. Um, I was born in, uh, actually, I grew up in Spanish Fork, but my doctor delivered in Payson. So I was actually delivered in Payson in the old hospital over there, um, uh, May 11th, 1953. And uh, that same doctor actually delivered my first two in that same hospital years later. Um, my parents were Kenneth and Ruth Pinniger in Spanish Fork. I was the third of seven children, two older brothers, Richard and Gary, and then a younger sisters and a brother, Laurie, Robin, Brian, and Karen. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, where did you go to school? Uh, all my early education was there in Spanish Fork from kindergarten through high school, and then came to BYU and studied early childhood education there. Um, I felt like I wanted something that would be helpful to my being a, a mother and, and a wife and got great training there with the early childhood education. And it turns out I ended up having almost my own little preschool nursery with children coming very quickly in our marriage. So uh, it was very helpful to have that kind of background and training. That is wonderful. Um, some of the important memories that you had as a child? Um, I think my dad was a little bit of, uh, he had a, an adventurous spirit. Um, uh, he was also an entrepreneur and did a variety of things. He was a building contractor. Um, he had a, a trucking line. He um, was in politics. And he kind of liked to do exciting things. So I, one of our favorite memories growing up was we took a motor home across the country to all these church history sites. And this was the year of the World Fair in uh, Montreal. So he, we wanted to go to Montreal. And his mother, uh, my grandmother, was also very adventuresome. So she followed us in her car uh, with Grandpa. And we saw all these wonderful ch church history sites along the way, saw the Hill Camorra pageant. And when we got to the World's Fair in Montreal, we all thought it was going to be Disneyland as kids. <clears throat> well, it's not. A World's Fair is not. They're expositions. And so after the first day there, we were all kind of like, where's the rides and all of the fun? And so my dad says, well, why don't we go to Seattle and see the Space Needle? And that's the other side of the country. <laughs> so we traveled and went through the the Great Lakes and the locks there and drove, it took us five days to get back over to Seattle to see the Space Needle and then back home. But um, uh, I remember having, we had eight track tapes back then mm -hmm. and my dad's favorite musical was The Sound of Music. So we, we have that music down pat. And he also played the trumpet. So we had, um, oh, what, do you, what was that band? The Tijuana Brass. Oh, yes. We, we know all of their music, too. <laughs> so when we hear that music, that's what we all think of in our families, that trip we had across the country. That was a great time. How old were you at the time? Just an early teen. Mm -hmm. So I had a couple of older brothers and all the rest younger, and, and Grandma and Grandpa there, too. So it was just so much fun and so memorable. And then to see all these church history sites, too, that we had never seen, and uh, it was just a really impactful time together. How long? It was probably a good three weeks at least uh, doing all of that. Uh, but that's what my dad liked to do. Be adventuresome uh -huh. and to just decide. We're going to, uh, yeah, just, you know, this wasn't what the kids thought it was going to be. Let's go to Seattle. <laughs> that sounds like a wonderful, wonderful um, <clears throat> father and fun time. Is there an experience from your childhood that prepared you for your life's work now and for your focus and your energies now? 
Well, I think my whole focus most of my adult life has been my family and my children, my husband and family. And uh, being the oldest daughter, I think I got a lot of experience um, with responsibility that way. Um, I do remember one time, though, when I was maybe 13, and a family that lived across the street with six little kids asked me to stay with them for three days. And I don't know that I would dare do that with my children, but she apparently did, thinking, well, my mother was across the street. And uh, for so for three days, I had these six little kids, baby in cloth diapers, and uh, never a call from the parents to check in. or I was just kind of on my own. And it kind of opened my eyes to the responsibility day and night that come with being uh, responsible for these children. And so by the time they came home and I walked back across the street, it was like this relief because at 13, you're just not quite used to that much responsibility. But it really wasn't that long before I had six little kids <laughs> under the age of eight that of my own and a husband that traveled a lot and was alone with these kids a lot too. So I think I had a little taste of it early on. And then my own brothers and sisters and other babysitting opportunities. And, and then to go to BYU and study early childhood education. Um, I understood children maybe a little bit better and and it, it did prepare me and help me a lot. You were immersed in it at a mm -hmm. very young age. Uh-huh. Who were some of the women that you admired while you were growing up? Well, probably my mother who taught me how to do all of these things at home, to be a homemaker, how to cook, how to clean, how to care for a baby. Um, she, she would point out details, how to wrap up this baby in a blanket and how to hold it and, and uh, feed it and, and do all of those things. Um, she was very instrumental in those everyday things and to see how she managed seven children. And my father was always busy too, a lot, and gone, doing what he had to do with his work. But she held down the fort while, you know, daddy was gone. And, uh, and taught me all of those things that I would need to know. Um, I think also my grandma Pinnaker, who was uh, close, and just a great example to me, one who had complete charity she cared for her family that was the most important thing in her life but i remember she um, had some siblings first a sister who had a stroke and she was not happy with the care she was getting in this care center so she brought her home with a hospital bed and cared for her until she passed and then the same thing happened to one of her brothers she brought him home in a hospital bed and cared for him till he also passed away and i thought you know these siblings of hers had children and grandchildren, but she took it upon herself to take them in and be their 24-7 care. And I could see it taking a toll on her health, but it didn't matter to her. That was more important. So she was just a great example. And she would have the grandkids over, have a night with just the granddaughters, another night with just the grandsons, and just built these relationships with us that were just fabulous. That's my Sunday nights, my memories, is going to Grandma's house with all the cousins and aunts and uncles. And, and so she really taught us to put family first and to always be there for each other. Were you surrounded by extended family? Mm -hmm. um, all of my aunts and uncles on my dad's side were right here in this valley, all my cousins. So it was so much fun to know that we could always, almost weekly basis, we saw each other at our grandma's house. And my other grandma too, she lived a little further away and those cousins were farther away in other states, but um, we were still close. And I could name every single one of them. My mother's the youngest of eight and um, big families. And I, can, I still know all of my cousins, but it took that effort of having the reunions and our parents um, wanting and having that desire to be together, bringing all of us together so I feel very blessed to have had that from both sides of my family. And that set a tremendous foundation for you. It did. And what you have done. Um, 
Do you have a particular person that you felt was a mentor for you? I would probably go back to my grandma Pinnaker again. Well, my mom too. Mom taught me everything I needed to know at home. Um, grandma taught me a lot about compassion and um, organization. She was organized like nobody I've ever known. I used to love to open her drawers and just see everything in place. And it gave me kind of that desire that I've never quite achieved, but I work at. Um, but she really was always there. I, I remember one night um, I was left in charge of my younger brothers and sisters. And my younger brother was only almost eight. He was almost his birthday, but he had an appendicitis attack. I didn't know what it was. I couldn't reach my parents, so I called Grandma, and she was right there. And next thing we knew, he was in the hospital having surgery. Um, but it, I didn't know who else to call. But I knew I could call her, and that she would be there. Wonderful, thank you. Um, what did you enjoy doing during your teenage years, young adult years? Well, I used to love to snow ski and water ski. Uh, not so much anymore. I don't feel like I have the time to mend yes. <laughs> from injury. <laughs> uh, but that was always fun to just go with friends. We would go almost every Saturday snow skiing. And um, back then we didn't wear helmets or goggles. Or we'd just go. And I remember my eyes just watering going so fast that um, but it was just so much fun. Um, and then just being with friends and doing all kinds of fun things. I did um, a lot of cheerleading in high school and at BYU. And so sports were big. Uh, I always enjoyed sports. Uh, my dad always had a season tickets at the BYU basketball, football. So we attended a lot of those games as well. So, And my, my brothers played sports too. So we we were always involved in doing that, but uh, it was usually centered around family and friends. Tell me about your years at BYU. You talked about being on a cheerleading squad. Um, you're involved in some other things there, angel flight, and of course your academics. Tell us a little bit about what life was like for you at BYU. It was, it was great. I loved it. Um, my first year, my friend, one of my best friends and I decided we wanted to live over in the dorms. And my brothers hadn't. They had just commuted from Spanish work. And so my dad assumed that that's what I would do. So with my mom's help in convincing him, <laughs> I was able to move over and live in the dorms. And then we had to convince him my second year to allow us to move off campus mm -hmm. into, another, into an apartment. But good girls that I'd lived with my freshman year and uh, just had a great experience there. Uh, there's a spirit at BYU that I, I appreciated. Uh, my dad had gone there, my older brothers, all the rest of my siblings too. So it's kind of been our school, our alma mater. Um, I did enjoy Angel Flight. Um, I found that it was, it was one of those organizations, a, a roommate and I were walking through the student center one day and they had a table and encouraged us to come and rush and so we did and were able to be accepted into that organization and I learned a lot of um, discipline through that I was in part of a performing group in that that traveled a little bit too that uh, sang and performed um, but also a great love for country and the sacrifice that these uh, men and women were making that were, I was on the Air Force side of it. There was an Army side of the ROTC there. Um, but I, I gained a great uh, respect for those people that were putting their lives, their careers into that field to defend our country. And that was um, Vietnam War, was it still? It was, was it just, that was just after the end, after, this was in the um, early to mid 70s. And, uh, but still, conflicts around the world, and, and you don't know what's around the corner. Yet these people, these young men and women, were stepping forward and making that their life career to be involved in defending our country. So 
So you would perform sing, play, violin? Well, I try on violin. <laughs> Piano, I had a lot of um, training in that. Um, but I took junior high orchestra with my best friend who played violin and tried my best. And it's, it's the same key as piano, so I can read the music. Um, and I, it's a tough instrument. If you don't know exactly the technique, make it sound good. Uh, but I, I tried hard and did it into high school. And then um, a few years ago, there's an orchestra at BYU called New Horizons for people over 40 who either want to learn or get back into it. So I joined that orchestra and kind of refreshed some of those skills and got some more training. We were the lab for the music students. So they would come, conduct, teach, help us, and, and it was just fabulous. The last couple of years have been a little busy, so I haven't been able to participate there, but that was so fun to get back into that. What a great experience. It is. How fun. Um, tell us how you met Alan. About he um, came to a basketball game one night in the Marriott Center and uh, came down afterwards, introduced himself. And it was right before Christmas. It was the first time I had gone without a date to a game, which was perfect timing. Yes. I was with my mother. <laughs> okay. And so um, after, shortly after that, um, we started dating after the first of the year. And never steadily a bit consistently and uh, after a few months of that he went away to California for about a month to work on a new show they were putting together for Vegas and it was during that month that we both realized that we did care about each other more than we had realized and so he came back home and within about five days we were engaged very very quickly but they were opening this show in Vegas and then going on this world tour and he said, I want you to come. So we need to be married, of course. Uh, my dad's not going to let me go either. No. <laughs> so um, you, you kind of picture what your courtship and marriage will be. Mine was not anything what I had planned or pictured. Um, we went to LA, announced it, flew right back. This was on July 3rd. You can't do anything on July 4th. So the 5th, we went to the Provo Temple, received my endowments, to the courthouse, got a marriage license, to the airport where he flew to Vegas to open his show, and we didn't see each other till our wedding day, which was, um, that was the 5th, 11 days later. And I drove with my family after that to Star Valley, Wyoming, to a family reunion. So. We get to the reunion and I announced to all my family up there, I'm getting married and my grandma said, you know, he's your cousin. And I said, no, <laughs> I didn't. But she says, don't worry, there's no blood. His grandma Osmond had married my great uncle when they were both, they lost their spouses. So his mother, or his father and my mother are first cousin step. So we are second cousin step. So our wedding day, he flew with his family to Provo we met, went to the Provo Temple, were sealed. Paul H. Dunn was a, f a friend of the family, sealed us straight back to the Provo Airport and back to Vegas. He had two shows to do and two shows the night before our wedding. And I had never seen him perform, ever. I had never seen the Andy Williams show. I, we watched Danny Kaye <laughs> and, and the, the Cleaner Sisters that were from Orem. And I remember watching that. So our wedding night was the first time I ever saw him on stage. And I knew I'd heard them on the radio. I knew there was Donnie and brothers, but until I met Alan, I didn't know their names. He gave me albums. I didn't have their albums. So I started l listening to their music and I went, oh my goodness, I've been performing to their music with Cougar Band. I didn't even realize that was his music. And so, when he came off stage that first show, I said, wow, you guys are good. <laughs> and I said, I didn't know you played the trumpet. You, you'd think you'd know that. I didn't know you could dance like that. Um, all of these things, I was really quite amazed at, uh, at what I witnessed. And so we didn't even get to have a reception for five weeks. 
we uh, went from there to England for about three weeks and had to do things there and then came back just for like two days to have a reception and back out on the road again. And I had never traveled like that before. So, but we had his whole family on our honeymoon. <laughs> again, you don't picture these kind of things. Um, so it was quite interesting. We got uh, over in uh, to London and and Margaret had a special, and she had a, somebody fell out, and she said, um, "Brothers, I need you to come be on my special." So they came to me and said, "We need to move your reception a day." And we called my mother in Utah, and she said, "Are you kidding me? Not on not on your life. Invitations are out, caters set." So Anne Margaret had to adjust and made it work for the brothers, and we were back home when we needed to be back home. Oh. So that was just not what you planned, that I planned on. I had the, t everything totally differently in my mind, but I wouldn't change a thing. This is what happened, and I'm grateful that it did, and, and we felt like it was a good thing to happen as quickly as it did. Uh, we had some very wonderful confirmations um, that this was right. And I was, you know, grateful for that, to to have the Lord tell me, this is where you're supposed to be. This is who you're supposed to be with. And uh, so it was, it was a, a great time, but it felt like a whirlwind at the same time. Well, it sounds like a whirlwind. It mm -hmm. was a whirlwind. How mm -hmm. long did you know him prior to getting engaged? You said it was probably about six months, but never steady. So, I guess the engagement made it steady. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it did. Wow, what a story. What a story. Um, share what your early years of marriage were like. You've already mentioned you had children quickly. What, what, was, what was life like for you? It was, for me, it was quite overwhelming to have... Um, First of all, all the travel, but then when the baby started coming, that was a little more difficult. Sometimes we would take them, but a lot of times it was just easier just to be at home. But we had, um, well, the first, the first three were under two and a half, and that third baby was an emergency C-section. He was premature, not ready in intensive care. We just about lost him. And shortly after that, I find out that I'm, I've got number four coming. And at that point, I had, gosh, oh, how old would he have been? Like eight months old, maybe a, not even two-year-old. And so the first four were under four. And I remember um, I was in a primary presidency at the time. My primary president had seven children. The first counselor had, I think, ten. And I, I cried. I was like, I, I don't know if I can do this. And my, my primary president said to me, she got a little stern and just kind of woke me up a little bit. And she says, yes, you can. Of course you can and you will. And just, you know, she had done it. The other counselor had more than done it. And uh, I said, okay, I will do this. And, I can, and I'm, I'm excited, but I felt a little overwhelmed at the time. After the trauma of that third baby, and here came number four, and it was wonderful. It's kind of like you break through that barrier. And then five came, and then six came, and we had six under eight. And at that point, I was, I was really quite overwhelmed. And then the boys started uh, performing, and we started traveling with them. And uh, waited a couple of years and then had two more boys. But my, my husband was diagnosed with MS. Um, after our sixth, we just had six boys, but we felt strongly that there were still more children to come, and we're so grateful that they did. He's got primary progressive MS, and which means that it continually goes down, downhill. Um, one of our sons has the remitting relapsing kind of MS, where you can go down and recover, and you go down and recover. There are treatments for that kind, but for my husband's kind, no treatments available at all. So we've just done our research, and um, it's been a part of our life. He was, we were married, I think, barely 
12 years when he was diagnosed. And we just provide natural supplements and good natural remedies. And his neur neurologist is very happy with where he is at this point. Uh, he's disabled, obviously, can't perform, but he is sharp and creative and continues to be productive um, with his computer and creating all kinds of things. So um, we're happy where, where with things are, but it's become a part of our lives and our younger children don't know anything differently. They've only known him with MS. Where were you living at the time when your children, when you first got married and, and you had those first six, where were you living at the time? Um, the very early part, we were in Los Angeles doing uh, the Donna and Marie show down there. And then we moved back up here. Um, that was an interesting time because right after we got married, um, I had, was just ready to start my student teaching, and so that required me to leave my husband in California, come back and move in with my parents, and teach at a school in Payson. And we'd only been married about two months, and I was really not really happy with the situation, of course. He wasn't either, and so it didn't last very long. And I went into my principal and, and explained that, you know, I really wanted to be with my husband. We're newlyweds, and he, I knew, I'd known him all my life, this principal from Spanish Fork. He was also a bishop at the time, so he put on his bishop's hat, mm -hmm. and he said, your place is with your husband, and that's where you need to be. So I went back to California and uh, decided that that was more important than doing my student teaching at that time. By the time we came back to Utah, though, the third baby was on the way, and it was more than I could even consider trying to do again. So we spent the next um, several years here in Utah. Um, after we had eight children, um, my husband and his siblings had been always traveling to do their shows. There came an opportunity in Branson where we would have our own theater and the people travel to see you. You stay in one place. So we sold our home and moved to Missouri with these eight children from preschool, two-year-old up to our oldest was 16 at the time, and had an experience there that we will never forget. It was a tiny little branch. Um, Mormons were not welcome there. We put them in public school at first, and they faced all kinds of challenges there because of religion. Um, at first, there wasn't even a seminary program, so we had to homeschool that. Um, then, after about a year, we had early morning seminary. We tried homeschooling, and finally we found a private school run by a Pentecostal church. And we found out very quickly that that was even harder <laughs> because um, they were very fearful of Mormons. And so the boys, I think, grew as much as anybody going through that, what they experienced in that school. They continued uh, being great missionaries where they could. By the end of that year, um, six of the students and one of the teachers were baptized. And uh, I mean, the gospel means more to us than anything, so that was very special to us. The uh, valedictorian that year was a girl that got baptized. And in her address, she spoke, um, closing with, a reference, well, she didn't give the reference, but it was a verse out of the Book of Mormon. You know, press forward with steadfastness in Christ and the perfect brightness of hope. And, and uh, she didn't give the reference, but the headmaster and the pastor sitting behind her were giving their amens to what she was saying. It's, it was beautiful, but um, it strengthened every one of us in our testimonies and in our resolve to, to help build the kingdom wherever we were. So it was, it was a great uh, time. But when my husband got to where he couldn't do it anymore, our boys were starting to go on missions and getting serious. Um, our oldest son met his wife there, who was uh, a young convert. And actually our third son met his wife there. And so we thought, you know, we need to get back to Utah. We came home and 
actually for two years did the North American tour of Joseph with the boys, where uh, they were Joseph and the brothers, and our two little ones were in the dream choir. So we did two years of, of that as well, and taking school on the road. It's, it was interesting. Um, our third son actually returned from his mission to Minneapolis where we were on tour, had to be released by phone to the stake president back home, and he continued with us on the tour. Our first grandchild was born opening night in Dallas. She flew in just to see opening night and went into labor, and we had the baby there at Baylor and then went on and did opening night. It's, it's just been um, kind of one of those crazy, unpredictable, spontaneous lives, I think, that I never dreamed it would be that way, but, but it's been wonderful. Something that you never imagined? No. Ever? No. So what is the phrase that life is a thrill minute? What is it that you say? Um, oh my goodness. I, let me see if I have it written down. Anyway, that's what your life has been. And so we have used that phrase. Minutes. It's a thrill a minute. <laughs> it just is. Oh, wow. Um, so you have been an advocate for families and for strong families. For That's, that's been your banner for your life. Well, it has. Um, and when we were living in uh, Missouri, we just felt this strong need, especially my husband. Um, it was the early days of the internet and URLs. He secured the family.com. We created a nonprofit 501c3 um, called One Heart uh, for strengthening families. We've worked with the School of Family Life at BYU, um, just putting good content out there for families and trying to do all we could. Uh, he's been on the Speakers Bureau, and so we would travel and speak on behalf of families and strengthening them. Um, recently though, about a year ago, we have shifted the focus. That's a, a very broad focus and so many areas to, to look at when strength, with strengthening families. But there seems to be a great need right now with orphans and refugees. And so we're working with um, a dear friend of ours we've known for years, uh, John Bishop. And uh, we have these connections with royal families. And so the royal families pick their orphanage that they want to make this work for. And then we're able to work through them to um, funnel these funds to the orphanages. And they're, they're all over the world. Uh, but these royal families, uh, they're not government, but they're recognized and um, still have a degree of uh, respect and power, I guess, where they are. And so they're able to open these doors to help us do what we want to do in these countries and help these uh, children. A lot of them are refugees coming into some of these countries that really need to be addressed that don't have parents. And how do we help them? And so that's been our focus for the last year or so. We uh, just had the Prince of Ethiopia here during conference and we were able to host him for a week. Uh, the church helped with that, and we were able to show him, you know, the humanitarian and bishop storehouse and a variety of things. He was here 15 years ago and involved with the, the church there and helped with uh, so many things, opening doors for missionaries in Ethiopia. Because of his effort 15 years ago, we now have four branches in Ethiopia. There were only two missionaries at the time and he opened the door to more visas and, and helped that way. And the church responded to and helping donate through the Red Cross to Ethiopia. And so that's, he's the most current one, but we've worked with the, the Duke of Portugal and in Spain and met with the royal family in England and Georgia. And um, we just have some really wonderful hopes and desires for what we can accomplish in this area. But we're just starting out with this one. And hopefully this will blossom into something that's very beneficial for these children that just need help. And it's not just, there's an education part of it, that these uh, kids are not just going to be given resources to be fed or clothed. They're going to be educated so that they, at the age of 18 right now, they're pushed out of the orphanage and they're on the streets. 
and the cycle just continues and it's get, getting worse. So they will be able to step out of that environment with um, knowledge, you know, education, so that they have some kind of a skill to continue on and be able to take care of themselves. Great we're hopeful that we're, we're new. We're, we're very green with it, but we have a lot of people that are excited about it, especially these royal families that want to help this, these causes in their own countries. That's tremendous. Um, if you're comfortable sharing, what's been the greatest hardship or challenge that you've had and, um, in your life? And, and what have you done to face it and overcome it? You know, I, I think back on it and probably challenges like everybody has. Um, probably our biggest one has been the MS because it affects the whole family. Um, but it's such a part of our lives. We don't really look at it as a challenge, if that makes sense. It's just part of our lives. So we get the best care we can get. Um, he's got a little electric cart that we take apart and put in the trunk of the car and goes everywhere with us. I remember the first day he got that, we went to an RSL soccer game and we were sitting up in one of those little boxes and I didn't, I lost him. I, where did he go? And I saw him down on the field and I thought, oh, how did he get on the field? But he managed um, and suddenly he had a little more independence. Uh, he, he doesn't stop. And I think that's why it doesn't feel so much of a challenge because he um, just looks at it as part of life and does all he can for himself and uh, tries to be as helpful as he can and do all that's necessary to be the best that he can in improving. We are seeing a physical therapist that's helping with exercises that he works on and does. So, But it does affect what you can sometimes do and where you're limited. And so to be out throwing a ball and catch with grandkids now, not gonna happen. But he can sit there and watch them play catch and be supportive. We can go to their ball games. Um, you, you just kind of roll with what it is. But we know that um, the Lord is there with us every step of the way. That if this is what he wanted to have us deal with, to make us to be what we have to be, he knows best. And so we, we just trust in him. Face it with a great love. Well, you do. And then that really is the first principle is faith. So we, we just trust and it's not always easy to submit. But when we do, we know that he's in charge and, and he, he knows what's best. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, are there any words of wisdom or maxims that you have lived your life by? Well, I think my dad, um, he, he just uh, was so full of integrity. And he would always say, my word is my bond. And uh, he did a lot of building projects on a, on a handshake. And uh, one of my sister's husband asked him, he's been gone about seven years now, but asked him one time, how many times have you been sued? And he said, never. And he said, well, how many times have you had to sue somebody? And he said, never. We, we shook hands. We did what we agreed to do, and it all worked out. Not that he wasn't ever taken advantage of. Um, I know he was, but um, he, I guess, chalked it up for experience and moved on. And so he taught us to be um, honest and true as the day is long. Um, he was very, very, um, uh, had a very strong testimony of tithing. And I remember he was, on his deathbed, and my brother said he woke him up in the middle of the night and said, get my checkbook. And he says, it's four in the morning. And he said, I, I need to pay my tithing. And he says, you've, you've done that. He says, I know, but I want to do this. And, and he accommodated him and, and got it done. Um, that was really important to him. And he taught us, don't ever figure your 10% 
and just give some odd number. He says, you always round it up. He says, you never want to be stingy with the Lord. But his father was that way too, and his grandfather, uh, my great-grandfather. So it was a long line of uh, being true to what you said, being honest with the Lord, doing everything you could to, to be faithful. Um, there's another little one that my mother-in-law taught me. She said that uh, an ounce of morning is worth a pound of afternoon. <laughs> I, I learned that sometimes the hard way. But if I would get up early, get myself together first, and then go get my children up, I got so much accomplished in the morning. Otherwise, you know, I learned in the early years, if I didn't, I didn't shower till afternoon. So I learned from her, get up early and get yourself together first. Have that quiet time for yourself, a little devotional in the morning for yourself. And then I was in the right frame of mind to go get the kids up. I was um, not groggy and irritable. I was a little more put together and pleasant to be able to get the kids up. Wonderful. Um, what would you like to be remembered for? You know, I don't care if anybody remembers me, but my family, really, that's kind of where my focus has been. Um, I hope that they know forever that, that I knew what was truth, uh, what they've been taught was truth. Um, I feel like even as a grandmother in this chaotic world, I still want to have an influence. Um, even though I'm not in their homes on a daily basis, I'm there frequently. But I want them to know that what's important to me, and I hope becomes very important to them. Uh, at the end of 2012, uh, we've always been faithful of reading the Book of Mormon with our family in the mornings. Once we became empty nesters, Alan and I would we started reading at night before uh, bedtime. And that was so nice because we weren't rushed. We could read a few chapters if we wanted to. And, but every now and then we might get in late and we might skip a night. And so at the end of 2012, I just said, this is crazy. Why would we want to miss a, a day of blessings there? So let's commit to never ever miss a day starting this new year. And so I talked to my grandchildren that could read, and I said, will you take the challenge with me? and do this every day. And at the end of the year, we'll have this big Book of Mormon party, and we'll have food and games and all kinds of things. Well, now little brothers and sisters get excited, and they want to come. And my big boys are calling and saying, Mother, we read every day. Can't we come? So it became a family um, goal, and at the end of the year, every, every one of them had accomplished that. And so we said, we need to create something that uh, is memorable. So we came up with a little Book of Mormon plate that said, I read, I've read the Book of Mormon with their names in the year and drilled three holes and put the rings in it. And so every year that they would read it, we'd get another plate and put on it. And we've you know, created some other ones that are a little more substantial now that are metal. Uh, last year, um, our Sophie, no, I mean our Sasha, was turning 16, and she wanted to have it read before, she was turning 15 then, she wanted to have it read before her birthday in February, and so she started and had it read in 29 days. I said, if, if she can do this and go to school full time, what's anybody's excuse? Uh, we have a little uh, grandson, Zach, who is actually autistic, and he was on his third time through at the end of the year last year. So we gave him two plates. He had earned that. Uh, but it's become so fun now at the end of the year to have each of them stand up and say, this is my favorite story or this is my favorite person and tell why. Um, there was a little four-year-old, this last one, that we all kind of laughed. We said, who was your favorite person? He said, Moses. <laughs> We all laugh. We say, well, you know, they speak of Moses in the Book of Mormon. It's in there, too. Uh, but, but they were all involved. And what the blessings have been for our family to have everyone on the same page. Uh, when we had last conference uh, in the spring and got the counsel from President Monson on reading the Book of Mormon every day, I printed up his words of that short little message laminated it with magnets 
and it's on all of their refrigerator doors where they can see that every day. Um, uh, we just can't stress enough how important that has been to our family to have that as a daily um, strength and support to the days that we face in this crazy world, to have that backing and that strength of the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful experience for your family. It has to be been. Part of that. What advice do you have for women in Utah? Well, I love Utah, and we've lived other places away from here and traveled all around the world many times. And many times they say that we are living in a bubble here. I like the bubble. I really like it. And it's not that we don't have challenges right here at home. But there is something about Utah that has, it's always been home to me. Um, but I feel like we have blessings here that um, I had to search for other places. I had to you know, look for them and create them in other places. They're just in abundance here, the, the blessings that we have. Uh, just so powerful. Um, I have neighbors who are like-minded, who, who believe as I believe, who are trying to do the same things that I'm trying to do and are support to me. And, and I really am grateful for that. We did have great experiences away from here where we felt like we were, we were a minority, a very tiny minority, and it was a great experience. But when we would drive east, we would take a few days. When we were coming west back to Utah, our boys wouldn't stop. It was just a, you know, straight through, could not wait to get back to Utah. But it's home, it's where our roots have been. And I know people feel that about where they live, but I think there's something special right here in Utah. Thank you. Um, what would you still like to accomplish in your life? Well, I don't feel like I'm ever really done, <laughs> but my family is my, my focus. And if I can continue um, doing all I can to have the influence with my children and their children, that when I'm gone, maybe that will continue on with, you know, other generations. Um, I just feel like I have a responsibility to be an example of the believers. And if I'm, if I'm doing that and living it, um, you're, I think you're drawn to that. And hopefully that that's, I mean, that's what my grandparents were, my parents. Um, I didn't really know my great grandparents. I have one brief recollection of one pair, but I have their histories and I have their stories and boy, do they strengthen me uh, and beyond. So I feel like I need to be that example and be there involved in their lives, um, taking advantage of every opportunity to share and teach and I mean, just driving in the car, there's opportunities with them. I had a little grandchild going to kindergarten in the back seat, taking her uh, one day, and, and she said, the boys in my class don't govern themselves. The girls govern themselves. And I thought, who's been teaching you, <laughs> you this? But she had learned that, not from me, but I thought, isn't that nice that somebody that young has that knowledge? how important it is to be in charge and to be self-disciplined and govern yourself. Yeah. How many grandchildren do you have? Uh, right now we have 27. Are they all close by? Almost all of them. Mm -hmm. The farthest one away is St. George. Oh. And you gather them? Often. We do. That family will be here this weekend. Oh. <laughs> so, um, and they were here a week ago. So they come frequently. And, and the rest are right here. That's a blessing, a great blessing. Is there anything additional that you'd like to pour in about your life? I think I've talked too much no, <laughs> today. I, don't know. I, don't know. Um, I, I can't think of anything. It's, it's just been a, a, a great life. It's been a learning life. Um, uh, 
I don't know. I feel like I've had great examples to follow. Uh, I feel very blessed. Uh, not that we don't stumble and stagger and and kind of work our way through all of these things. Um, seems like we start the day out saying, I'm going to be good today and I'm going to do all these wonderful things. And by the end of the day, when you report and you go, oh, sorry, just I really messed up here and I didn't do this right. And uh, but we're trying every day to, to be a little bit better. And when we do stumble and fall, we get back up and and know that we can be better and and that there's so much more ahead. This is really just temporary. With my husband's MS, that's what we talk about all the time. This is temporary, and the day will come when we don't have to have these kind of limitations or challenges, but we're, we're whole. So we have faith for that day to come. Well, certainly life did not take the path that you expected it to take. You've done marvelous, wonderful things with your life and been a great influence to Thank you. Too many and will continue to be that. And that influence and example there. And um, people will draw strength from from your life stories that you've shared. So thank you. Well, thank you. And I have gained strength from the women that I have seen through this project from all walks of life. I think it's a a wonderful program that you're involved in and helping to further here um, for the women of Utah and probably beyond. Yeah. It's our hope. Mm -hmm. That's our hope that it will. Well, thanks for all you do. Well, you're welcome. And thank you. Um, anything else? That... I can't think of another thing. <laughs> well, Suzanne, it's been, it's been wonderful. Thank wonderful. you.